afternoon and also good evening, everyone. Um, so uh, we are Wenjuan and also Mihaly. We are very excited to welcome everyone to this online symposium, The Remarkable Diversity in the Rate and the Mechanism of Sex Chromosome Evolution. So we are very pleased to see that today we have gathered 183 participants, so affiliates to institutes from 34 different countries across four continents. Um, so the most participants are from Europe, represent like 62%. And the next is America, about 27%. We also have some uh, a certain proportion from Asia and also from Australia. And we are excited that for this meeting, we have in total 39 presentations and including uh, 36 uh, full talks and the three speed talks. So the talks uh, include, um, rep uh, going to include a vast diversity of topics on sex chromosome evolution. So including topics such as the evolutionary instability of sex chromosome and sex determination systems, recombination of rights, strata formation, dosage compensation, sexual conflict, and many other exciting topics. The major uh, study organisms are from the animal, animal kingdom. We also cover a series of system in plants and some few in the fungi systems. So now I will hand it to Mihaly to introduce the symposium uh, program, the related formats, and also the key, uh, special issue. Mihaly? Thank you, Wenjuan. So considering the schedule, we have in total 39 presentations for three days. 36 are full talks, which means 12 minutes of presentation plus three minutes for question. And we will have three speed talks, which means four minute presentation plus one minute for questions. On the right side of the presentation, you can see the schedule for today. During the meeting, we will record the presentations from the speakers that uh, signed the video and release consent form. During these presentations, you will receive a message from Zoom that recording is uh, in process. The recorded presentations will be available later online from the ASAP YouTube channel. So arranging the presentations and the schedule was uh, a little bit uh, challenging because uh, most of the presentation will be live. So we were restricted by the different time zones and the wide range of time zones of the speakers, which were varying from GMT uh, minus seven to GMT plus 10. We avoided to arrange the presentation in phylogenetic or taxonomic uh, context, but instead we use a less strict structure. So the first day is mainly reserved for presentation on the general mechanism of sex chromosome evolution, especially the role of sexual antagonistic uh, selection, meiotic behavior of sex chromosomes, recombination arrest, and strata formation. The second day is largely devoted to uh, recombination arrest, strata formation, and mechanisms of dosage compensation. Finally, the third day has presentation mostly exploring the evolutionary stability of uh, sex chromosome and sex termination systems. After each presentation, we will have uh, time for a few questions. So we kindly ask the speakers to keep the 12 minutes or four minutes time to depend if they have a full talk or speed talk because we have a very uh, tight schedule and only two breaks. And also during the talks, we will uh, help handling these questions. Uh, furthermore, uh, we can request the audience to keep the microphones muted in order to avoid the background noise. For the questions, the audience can use either the raise hand option in Zoom or simply type the question in the common uh, Zoom chat. So we will uh, help you with handling the questions. And if we run out of time, the remaining questions will be answered later during the discussion section. For, therefore, at the end of each day, we will have a discussion section. So we invite both the audience and the speaker to attend so that we can further explore the topics that have been uh, presented during the day. Furthermore, everyone is welcome to contribute during the discussion section with questions, ideas, or thoughts. In parallel to the um, online meeting, we have also organized a special issue in the Journal of Evolutionary Biology. Everyone is welcome to contribute to this special issue uh, with a manuscript uh, which could fit in the topic, which would be either research article, short communication, or review article. And this invitation applies to everyone, even if they have not present or attend during the online meeting. The minds, however, should be submitted the latest until the end of the year through the journal submission system. 
And if you have any inquiries, please don't, hes don't hesitate to email us, either uh, when Jan, when Joan, or me. So like um, many of you, I find the sex chromosomes to be the most fascinating um, part of the genome. And um, we have this canonical model where we have um, one member of the pair of the sex chromosomes is large and gene rich, and the other is small and degenerate as exemplified here by the human X and Y system. And this is also true in many systems um, where the heterogametic sex is, um, is the female, like in birds where we have this large gene rich C and small degenerate W. But we know that this sort of canonical model that all sex chromosomes are leading towards this, this sort of conserved end is not likely to be the case. And instead, we're here to discuss the remarkable diversity of sex chromosomes and sex determination systems that we find across the area of life. And, um, and you your know, slides are not uh, advancing. I think you should use presentation mode, please. Oh, I am. OK, so do you see what slide do you see? Sorry, just the first one. <sighs> OK, I am in presentation mode, but for some reason, it's freezing. It's going. Is it still, which slide is that? The sex chromosome diversity. The okay, and then if I advance, do you see that? It's number three now. Number three. Yeah, but we see your, it's not the presentation mode, it's the okay, presenter sorry. mode. All no right. problem. The, the problem is because I'm on my, um, Okay, sorry, I've messed up the schedule already. Um, okay, I'm gonna close my extra screen, which is causing me to have a problem. Right, yeah, sometimes. And now I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, how's that? No, it's perfect. Good yeah, now. okay, so. That's good. You would think I had never done this before. Great, so, yeah, so we're here to discuss um, this remarkable diversity of sex determination systems that we find across the tree of life and sort of explore the question of why there's so much diversity in such a fundamental process of sex determination. And I've been thinking about and trying to address these questions using the stickleback family um, of fish. And so, which has diversified in the past 30 million years or so. And so I'm going to give you a super fast um, overview of sort of everything we've learned in the past 20 years about sex chromosomes and sticklebacks. Um, so very little data and really just references are there if you want to learn, learn more. So we're going to start with the three-spine stickleback um, in which we, I identified an XY sex chromosome system on um, chromosome 19 over 20 years ago. Um, and since then, one of the huge efforts um, that we've that we've made is trying to sequence the full Y chromosome. So together with Mike White, um, we've now assembled using um, PacBio and HiC, as well as um, a Sanger sequencing of bacterial artificial chromosomes, a rather complete assembly of the Y chromosome, um, even including uh, the centromere. And what's really nice is that this assembly agrees completely with our previous cytogenetic data, suggesting that there are three inversions between the differentiate the Y and the X. So I'm just going to uh, go over two points from, from this study. The first is that we find three evolutionary strata as defined by synonymous divergence between the X and the Y, that again, the breakpoints of these strata are completely consistent with the breakpoints that we know of these known inversions between the X and the Y. So stratum one is 22 million years old. It's lost 82% um, of its genes are either missing from the Y or have stopped codons or mutations that would render them non-functional. Importantly, it also contains the sex determination gene, which I'll get to in a second. Stratum two is close to 6 million years old and 24% of its genes are non-functional. And then the third stratum is 4.7 million years old and it's lost about 30% of its genes. Importantly, this distinction between stratum two and three was not identified by our initial Illumina sequencing um, uh, project. And so just as many of you know, I mean, having the ability to do these long read sequences 
um, such as PacBio is I think really revolutionizing our ability to look in more detail at the evolution of sex chromosomes. So we also identified a duplication of the AMH gene, one of the usual suspects as a candidate sex determination gene in three spine sticklebacks. So this gene anti-mullerian hormone has a conserved role in vertebrate sex determination. In three spine sticklebacks, it's present on the Y, but not on the X, again, in the oldest stratum. It arose from a duplication and translocation of AMH from its parent copy on chromosome eight. And the Y copy is expressed only in males at the time of sex determination. It has functional domains that are conserved between the autosome and Y paralog, suggesting that it is indeed a functional protein. And in fact, functional tests are underway in Mike um, White's lab now. But interestingly, um, this gene has been um, co-opted as a sex determination gene and at least four other fish species. And as I'll mention later, probably also there's been independent co-option of AMH and one other stickleback species as the master sex determination gene. Okay, so that's the three spine sex chromosomes. Um, many years ago, we um, actually showed that this Y chromosome has actually fused to an autosome, autosome 9, in this closely related Japan C form, creating a neo Y or X1, X2 Y system. And June Katano showed that all of the um, sort of the genetic basis of reproductive isolation between Japan C and three spine sticklebacks is all found on these sex, this neo sex chromosome system. So it plays a key role, we think, in the evolution of speciation. We found an independent neo Y fusion in the black spotted stickleback, um, but this time the Y chromosome had fused to, to chromosome 12. So in this um, gastroosteous clade, we've been exploring several questions. So what are the consequences of these Y autosome fusions on patterns of recombination and degeneration? Did these Y chromosomes and these different species follow independent evolutionary trajectories? And then what can we learn something about what drove the evolution of Y autosome fusions um, from these young systems? And to address these questions, I've been working with Mark Kirkpatrick, his former PhD student, Andreas Dagalis, former postdoc Jason Sardell, and my former postdoc Matt Josephson. Um, and I'm not going to go to the details, but just to, to mention the strategy that we took, because we really needed phased sequences. We needed to know which sequences were X and which sequences were Y. And so we used this crossing system where we crossed a female um, three-spine stickleback to a male from one of the species that has the Neo-Y, and then we sequence the mom, the dad, one daughter, and one son. And so any SNP that's transmitted from the dad to his daughter is an X or a Neo-X sequence. And any SNP that is transmitted from the father to the son is a Y or a Neo-Y sequence. And I'm not going to show you any of the, the data, but just rather show you sort of the summary slide. Oh, sorry. We did this for both Japan C and Black Spotted. Um, so what we called quartets. And so we have sequences from 15 independent X and Y from Japan C and 15 independent X and Y from, from Black Spotted. And what did we learn um, is summarized here. So what we've seen is that um, this um, first stratum, the oldest stratum, stratum one is about 22 million years old. It's present in all three of these species, and all three species contain this AMHY gene indicated here by this red diamond. But then after the um, black spotted and three spine Japan C diverge, they, these sex chromosomes followed very independent trajectories. So in the three spine and Japan C, there was the formation of these other strata, stratum two and stratum three, again associated with inversions. Um, and then in the Japan C lineage, there was this further fusion which created a region of, of basically no recombination between the Neo-X and Neo-Y, the so-called stratum four. But very little degeneration has happened on this, this um, stratum four on the Neo-Y of Japan C. Very different events happened in the black spotted lineage. So shortly after divergence between a black spotted from the other species, these two new strata were created, which we're calling R1 and R2. These are also highly degenerate. They've lost about 70% of their genes. 
Stratum 1 actually has lost about 90% of its genes, more than the 80% in this lineage. So there's been a lot of degeneration happening. There was actually an expansion of the non-recombining region. This region 3 or Stratum 3 in black spotted is actually still pseudo-autosomal in the three-spine lineage. Um, so, and again, is, is quite de degenerate. And then we're not sure of the timing of the fusion to chromosome 12, but after the fusion, then we, um, there was evidence for at least two strata or, uh, or suppression of our combination has happened at least twice um, on the, the Neo Y chromosome in the, in the black spotted stickleback. So just to, to summarize that, we see um, that these fusions have resulted in recombination suppression on the Neo Y chromosomes. Um, but there's been not very much degeneration. And again, I just haven't showed you the, the details. So these X, Neo X and Neo Ys are diverged from each other, but there's very little loss of genes. Not surprisingly in the Japan Sea, it's only about a million years old of the fusion. We think that the fusion in black spotted is not much um, older than that. Um, these Y chromosomes then follow very different evolutionary trajectories. So they all share stratum one, but the black spotted stickleback has degenerated faster given that many, many more genes have been lost um, on the black spotted Y chromosome and they've evolved different strata. So recombination has been suppressed different, differently in the, in the two lineages. And we think that this sort of faster degeneration of the black spotted Y might result from the fact that it actually has a lower effective population size. And so, so neutral forces might be responsible for the re relatively faster degeneration of black spotted. Um, you know, the million dollar question is why did these um, fusions um, evolve? And at least in the Japan Sea stickleback, we have some evidence that sexually antagonistic G loci with sexually antagonistic effects are found on the Neo Y chromosome um, in the Japan Sea stickleback. And there's a manuscript in, in preparation um, by Andreas Douglas, which I won't have time to, to talk about today. Okay, so um, that's sort of where we are in our knowledge of gastroceus. Just very briefly, I want to tell you, um, point you to work in the nine spine stickleback, which also has an XY system located on chromosome 12. There's a really interesting set of papers from Mark Kirkpatrick's lab and Yuha Merla's lab suggesting that this, this sex chromosome actually arose by introgression from another species. However, we don't know what the sex determination gene is in this species. More recently, Jan Jeffries and I have been working on data from the Brooks stickleback. Dan has found clearly that this is an XY sex determination system with a very, very small sex determining region that we think is on chromosome 20. And super interesting is that it appears to be an independent duplication of AMH um, separate from the duplication that's happened in the gastroceus lineage. So again, convergence um, within even the stickleback family. And Dan and I will prepare a paper for the JEB special issue on this Brooks stickleback story. Yet another um, interesting story is developing in four spine sticklebacks where my PhD uh, student Zhu Yao Lu has also identified an XY system um, that we think is uh, chromosome 23. We've identified a gene that's a very good candidate um, called SAR1, not a usual suspect. Um, this gene is involved in sex differentiation in zebrafish. Um, and so we're quite excited to test the idea that the possibility that this is actually the sex determination gene in this system. There also appears to be a polymorphic inversion that's segregating on the X chromosome actually in this system. And that's something that we're exploring as well. And then finally, um, we still have to tackle the 15 spine stickleback. Um, but so far, I mean, that, that's where we are. It's been a fun, um, fun exploring the, the diversity of sex determination systems, even in this, this small group um, of fish. And um, I think we've, we've learned a lot, but of course there's still lots to do and I'm looking forward to the rest of the, of the symposium to learn more from all of you. So I think I've mentioned everyone who's um, done the work. This is a long list of people who've worked on stickleback sex chromosomes with me over the past 20 years. Um, with the more recent folks highlighted uh, in bold. And if there is time, I didn't waste too much, I'm happy to take questions. 
Okay, thank you very much, Mikhail, and also to Wen Zhuan for organizing this meeting. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, <clears throat> similar to Katie, which was a wonderful start to the um, symposium, I'd like to use this um, time just to give a very brief overview of some of the um, work that we've been doing on this system of Mercurialis annua and its relatives, um, an annual plant species that we've been working on for a number of reasons, um, principally because it's a plant genus in which there are several transitions between sexual systems, so between hermaphroditism and diese, and we've been also interested in what that implies regarding the sex chromosomes. Um, I'll start with just acknowledging the fact that lots of people have, have contributed to the work I'm going to um, uh, summarize here. I'll mention the people who have contributed specifically to the work I'll present, but it's based on a lot of um, work by quite a few people over the years. Um, the first slide really is, is this one, which is taken from a, um, a paper by Susanna Renner and, and Muller um, earlier this year. And I'm just mentioning it because our, the species that we have been working on principally is the species Mercurialis annua, which sort of sets the stage for my talk because it's seen here as a bit of an outlier in terms of the distribution of the genomic fraction of the sex determining region and the age of the, um, of the region. And I guess one of the messages of my talk is that we need to revise this particular picture, particularly in terms of that species, but there's another species in the genus which perhaps should allow um, Mercurialis still to feature prominently on a figure like this. The, the genus is um, a small genus, mainly of European plants. They're all wind pollinated. Most of them are dioecious. It's in the family um, Euphorbiaceae. And as I say, we've been interested in it because there are differences in the sexual system um, with um, dioecious species, monoecious species, species in which males co occur with monoecious individuals, which we call androdiaceae. There's very strong sexual dimorphism in the dioecious species and the androdiaceous lineage, where the males and the females differ in terms of their size, in terms of their inflorescences, their physiology, and so on. Um, and the three key questions that I'd like to just cover briefly now are what or how has the Y chromosome evolved in these different lineages that do have separate sexes? Um, how do populations evolve when the Y chromosome is lost? So when diese reverts to or evolves towards monese? And then finally, what is the genetic basis of these, or what might have been the genetic basis of these sexual system transitions? Um, regarding the sex chromosomes, this is a picture which is to be revised a little bit. The sex chromosomes are homomorphic. Um, they can't be distinguished morphologically. Uh, the Y-linked region has a non, non so the, the Y chromosome has a long, uh, a Y-linked non-recombining region. We thought of about 15 megabases in Mercurialis annua with perhaps 500 genes, but that might need to be changed, that, that view, and I'll come to that in a second. Um, however one looks at it, there is low XY divergence, and most of the non-recombining region in Mercurialis annua seems to be really quite young maybe less than a million years old, um, with very mild degeneration of the Y. There's only one gene that has a uh, premature stop codon and, and the DNDS ratio is very mild. In terms of sex bias gene expression, there is some. Um, it's not enormous, it's similar to what one finds in other dioecious plants, um, but there are 30 genes that are only expressed in males and half of them are on the Y chromosome. Interestingly, you can produce YY males, I won't go into how one does that, but they don't have an X chromosome and yet these plants are completely viable and almost completely fertile. They produce almost completely normal pollen, but the pollen um, grains are sterile and so there is some um, effect of having either two Y chromosomes or perhaps having uh, or not having an X chromosome. Um, in terms of the sexual dimorphism in the species, I mentioned the difference in inflorescences, and you can see it here. There's a contrast here between 
on the top image, uh, a male with these stalk-like inflorescences. And in the bottom, we see an auxiliary inflorescence in a monoecious plant, which is basically a female structure um, surrounded by some male flowers. And this is really the, the female morphology, which has been modified such that the females produce male flowers, but not in the same way that males do. So you can see that when males produce male flowers, they're on these stalks. And we've measured in two different experiments that these, um, that these peduncles, these, these inflorescent stalks, increase the siring success per pollen grain by about 60%. So it's an enormously, it's an enormous siring advantage that individuals have if they have that, that inflorescent stalk. Interestingly, the females, of course, have they don't have a Y chromosome, but they do produce pollen. So the lack of a Y chromosome is certainly not a problem for um, the primary male function pollen production. The pollen is perfectly decent pollen. However, the ability to produce these inflorescent stalks appears to be strongly associated with the Y chromosome. We don't know what the genetics is, but whenever we have a Y chromosome, we tend to have these floral, these inflorescent stalks. So this is perhaps a sexually antagonistic Mystic trait that is associated with the Y chromosome, where the primary sexual trait, the ability to produce pollen, is not. Um, the genus has a number of species that are perennial. They're all dioecious. Some of them are, are, are polyploid. The annual species um, also have variation in terms of their sexual systems, with some being um, dioecious or androdioecious and, and others being pure there are no males whatsoever. So males are lost from some of these species. We've been interested in the implications of that loss. The distribution, as I said, is European. I'm not going to go into the details here, but you can see that the species with the, main, the, with the largest distribution is indeed the dioecious species. But in the Western Mediterranean, we find these populations or species with um, monoecious plants. And this is the acquisition by females of a, of a male function. Work that goes back a long way now, um, this is what sort of got, got us onto this whole system initially, was by um, Darren Albard when he did his thesis with me a long time ago. And this is the, the picture that we had, we still have largely in terms of the evolution of the genus, where the annual lineages evolved from a perennial ancestral state. They stayed dioecious initially. So those are two dioecious species, Huerti and Annua. Annua then went through polyploidization and that coincided with the loss of dioecy and the evolution of this monoecious inflorescence. And then there was an interesting hybridization event between the sister species Huerti and this polyploid annua, bringing about what um, is an androdioecious sexual system with males and monoecious plants. And for a long time, we thought that the male, that the Y chromosome in these hexaploid populations must have come from Huerti because that was the male contributed to that in that hybridization event. But recent work that we haven't yet published um, indicates that in fact, the Y chromosome has in, ha, is associated phylogenetically with the perennials. And so if we look back at this, this sketch of the phylogeny, the Y chromosome has introgressed all the way back from these these dioecious perennial species into the hexaploid. So here's another case, as we saw in the sticklebacks of the, of the potential introgression of a Y chromosome from one species into another after, after its previous loss through, through polyploidization, perhaps. And so this is the picture that we have now of the movement of the Y chromosome um, amongst lineages. I won't go any into details here, but I should just point out that Melissa Tooks, who was also a postdoc in my lab, will be presenting a talk about this little story um, uh, at, the, at the bottom here, the, the, um, the evolution of the Y chromosome in, in, in Mercury Alice canariensis. And so that also fits into this picture where the Y chromosome is coming and going as a result of hybridization, polyploidization, and so on. So it's quite a dynamic picture. Um, a student who's just finished my lab, Jörn Gerchen, who's really the first author of this talk, um, has been working on um, improving our understanding of the genomics of the um, sex determination um, or the sex determining region in Mercurialis annua, but also in the other species. And I'll just point out very briefly that what we find is that the, the sex determining region in Mercurialis annua occurs in a, um, 
uh, a pericentromeric region, and that's the case we, we find that this region has high um, repetitive sequences across all of the chromosomes, all of the linkage groups. It might be another case here where the sex determination region has evolved in an area which had um, low recombination right from the start, and that's a picture that seems to be um, being found in a number of other systems. Um, and so this is the this is the figure that makes us think that we need to revise the view that we have of Mercurialis annua with this massive non-recombining region. In fact, when we actually look at um, divergence between um, or, or differentiation between the between the x and the y in Mercurialis annua, we see we only have a very narrow peak here. But it's in Mercurialis huetii, which is the um, sister species where we seem to see a very large area with um, high uh, sequence divergence between the X and the Y. And so we, we, we're evolving our, our view of exactly what's going on here. But it does seem clear that there are differences. Well, the first thing is that the Y chromosome is shared. It's the same Y chromosome that's shared amongst all of these dioecious lineages. But the size of the non-recombining region is vastly different between some of these species, suggesting that there has been quite, um, there have been big changes in the size of the non-recombining region. And this is another view of the implications of um, the um, large non-recombining region in Mercurialis huetii. Um, and just my final point is to, is to, is to note that in Mercurialis generally, we find males and females that are very different, but the males and females occasionally produce flowers of the opposite sex, something that one doesn't find in animals much. It's very common in dioecious plants, this leaky dioecious, diece. And we've been doing an ex a selection, a natural selection experiment um, over the last few years where we took males out of populations and allowed natural selection to operate on the females. Um, and that led to a very rapid increase in male flower production in these in the females. So we basically see a transition from Daisy to Monisi in just a handful of generations. Um, and Jörn Gerchen, as part of his, his thesis, has been looking at the genetic architecture of this of these of this transition or this rapid evolution of the um, of the of, of sex allocation. And his work is using using QTL analyses has revealed that this transition is the result of um, sex determining or, or, or sex allocation loci on different linkage groups, not on the uh, sex chromosome, where increase in male flower production, at least in some cases, leads to a massive decrease in female flower production. And indeed, we are now seeing after 10 generations of selection, females that first increased their male function and are now um, losing their female function. We've got basically the reversion back to males within a very short time. Um, so this is the summary of, of what we've been um, looking at and, and discovering over the last few years. Um, I won't read through this as I see my time has run out, but I guess the bottom line is that this is a very dynamic system and we've been really struck by how quickly these transitions can actually take place when the mating system is interfered with by removing males, for example. So thanks very much for your attention and again for inviting me to present this work. I'd like to start with thanking the organizers and of course also the people who did all the work including helping me thinking. Um, this is a puzzling sex chromosome and uh, Katie and John's talks have both introduced quite a few of the concepts but I want to point out that this has been puzzling people for more than a hundred years. The first example of a Y chromosome carrying genes was discovered in the guppy more than a hundred years ago and was by, by Johannes Schmidt and his student uh, Winger found several more Y-linked coloration factors which are have been shown subsequently by much work in evolutionary ecology and genetics to be sexually antagonistic and I got into the guppy story by wondering whether the modern methods could be applied to test whether the sexually antagonistic polymorphisms could be involved in selecting for suppressed recombination. So let me just tell you about recombination on the guppy XY system. Uh, this is what it looks like cytologically and this um, slide here, if I can maybe make a better pointer. Um, this 
uh, this picture here shows the um, what, what, what we can conclude from that. Uh, the chromosomes are paired, the XY pair is here. Um, there's a male specific heterochromatic region um, around a third of the way from the end, bit woozy as cytogenetics tends to be. So one would assume that there's a pseudo autosomal recombining partially sex linked region at one end, and probably here as well. I put a question mark because further cytogenetics using MLH1 foci, this is one of them, where you can stain where the crossovers happen, shows that they happen on the sex chromosome pair in blue, mostly at the tip, but sometimes further away from the tip. And in between, there's perhaps a region which does represent this male specific region, maybe not recombining. So that's where uh, we came in to try and understand this using uh, molecular markers and molecular genetics and population genomics. We did some genetics, which confirmed that there is a male determining region somewhere in the right part of the chromosome. I won't go into the details of this horribly complicated slide, but basically uh, the blue and the pink show um, X and Y link markers and things mostly behave right, except for a few assembly errors, uh, but we could show that the male determining region had to be to the right of this point because we did actually find a recombinant between the X and the Y. We've observed two of them among about 800 progeny. So, so far so good, and we do see a pseudo-autosomal region with lots of recombinants near the tip and perhaps another assembly error at the tip, but let's not worry about that. Um, but we do see that this region that I labeled in red as possibly pseudo-autosomal does sometimes recombine. It just doesn't do it very often. So we would expect to see the signal that, um, for instance, John just showed us for FST between the sexes, differentiation should be high in the sex determining region and low in these pseudo autosomal regions, but that's not what we see. If we look at the top figure differentiation, it's high all across this chromosome, not very high, but it's high. The genome mean for other chromosomes, it's about zero, but on the sex chromosome, it's above zero. But and it's because we have a lot of heterozygotes in males, we can see that in this lower part of the figure. But uh, we and others subsequently, Judith Manx's group notably, and others have looked at the same sort of thing, and nobody is finding male-specific variants in the region, or any big peak that tells us, oh yes, we've got a fully male-specific region of any extent. So it may well be like, um, this species that Katie mentioned with Dan Jeffries studying that has a very small sex determining region, but we don't see an old stratum uh, in this data. Now, these results have two problems. The first is that the sample of fish, it was 10 males and six females, is uh, from a captive population. So it's not a very big sample, and it's a captive population, which must obviously have gone through a bottleneck. Not a very severe one, but still. Those two factors, small sample and bottleneck, both mean that you expect linkage disequilibrium to extend over a wider genome region, wider recombination region, than if you hadn't had those problems. The other possible problem is that this is all different kinds of science. It's not just synonymous or, or neutral variants. And so differences in selective constraint will also contribute to differences in differentiation. So what we've been doing more recently is trying to do better. So summarizing so far, we find minimal differentiation. All genes appear to be present on both of the homologs, similar depth of coverage, no specific Y, y specific sequence, but there are problems. So we're looking now at natural population data. These are pool seek data. Um, and we were able to analyze synonymous site diversity in samples of 20 males and females, each sex from uh, 12 populations in different rivers in Trinidad where these fish live. And what you can see is we are seeing the same picture. So it wasn't just due to captivity. We're still seeing male diversity a bit higher than female diversity which is the same signal as I showed you before with 
elevated FST. We see it only for the sex chromosomes, not the autosomes. So that's exactly the picture I showed you before. We do see some regions where male diversity seems to go shooting up, but these are regions where um, coverage is low and the results are not as reliable as we would like. I'm showing you two different measures of diversity as well, pi and theta, because the difference between those two can tell us whether there's a region with a balanced polymorphism like you would have near a sex determining locus. And we don't see the signal that you'd expect. We see pi bigger than theta, which is the opposite of the signal you would expect. So we're not detecting, we're still not detecting any absolutely consistently male specific variants. We're not detecting a signal of balancing selection at the sex determining locus or really anywhere else in the chromosome. But we are seeing consistent results. So now that was just an example of the Aripo high uh, predation population. I won't talk about the low predation upriver populations because they have such low diversity that we know they've gone through bottlenecks and we have other signals. So it's important to understand that the natural demography or recent demographic history of these populations can also mess up these population genomic signals and make them difficult to interpret. So I'm just concentrating in this slide on five high predation populations that have high diversity. And in all of these, we see higher diversity in males than females, specifically for the sex chromosome, just like I showed you. But we also see higher diversity for the sex chromosome than the autosomes in males, and also a small difference in the same direction in females. And actually, this is just what you expect if there are sexually antagonistic polymorphisms. So let me try and explain that. This is a theoretical a slide from a, a figure from a theoretical paper by Mark Kirkpatrick and Rafael Guerrero, where they modeled what you would see in terms of polymorphism. They, they looked at coalescence time, but it's the same. Uh, it will be reflected, we can measure it as diversity near a male specific region or a male determining factor and a sexually antagonistic gene. And in each case, polymorphism will go up near that and it will fade away to zero if you went to an autosomal region, for example, just like we observe. But in a region closely linked in between, you'll see elevated diversity nearer either of those polymorphic regions. And this will be higher in males, but it won't be completely absent if you look in females. Diversity will be slightly increased in females. And of course, that's what we see. But it's important to understand that this recombination distance that they plot, they, they call it rho, uh, it's a standard notation for um, the population recombination rate. And it depends on the effective population size as well as the actual map distance. So we know in guppies, though, that the map distances in male meiosis are pretty small. This is two genetic maps from two Aripo populations of families, a smallish family, 42 individuals, and a biggish family down below from a low predation population, nearly 200 individuals. And we don't see recombination in males until we get close to the tip of the chromosome, whereas recombination events occur kind of randomly across the assembly, which is on the x-axis in females. And this recombination pattern is supported, at least for chromosome 12 and most of the other chromosomes, just like the cytogenetics said, it's supported by high GC content. You expect high GC when you have high recombination. I put chromosome 16 in here because this may be an exception. It's interesting to look at all the chromosomes because if it's as um, John was suggesting, an ancestral state to have, low re to have this recombination pattern, then we should see it probably for most of the chromosomes. But if we see different chromosomes looking different, then it might suggest that it's evolved to have this pattern on the sex chromosome. So we only see one or two chromosomes where it does disagree between, there's disagreement between the GC content and the genetic map, and we're still working on that. But by and large, it looks as if this may be an ancestral recombination pattern. And of course, 
most of the chromosome is not recombining in males. And so maybe a sexually antagonistic factor somewhere on that chromosome could show this association that we seem to be detecting. And that makes sense in line with something that Katie explained. We think that the um, guppy Y chromosome evolved in a fairly recent turnover event. Perhaps the ancestral species had a um, non-recombined Y chromosome that had degenerated. We think that because we and Judith Manx group also found evidence that the most closely related species have a highly degenerated Y that shows coverage in males versus females. It's specifically low for this chromosome. This, is, this chromosome is the sex chromosome in those related species, which are called, some people call them microbacilia. And I think that that probably evolved some time ago. And then there was a turnover event in the guppy so that it got a new Y chromosome, perhaps like Katie suggested for the Brook stickleback, I think it was um, a duplication of a gene from an autosome to become a maleness factor um, on this particular chromosome pair, which became a Y that hadn't degenerated and hadn't lost its genes yet because that was a recent event. That's our interpretation, that the guppy arose recently, uh, guppy Y arose recently by a mutation on and the ancestral X, hasn't degenerated. Its low crossover rate perhaps is an ancestral state. We do have evidence that other species may be similar. I haven't got time to explain. And that a low crossover rate would permit sexually antagonistic polymorphisms to establish themselves and to cause these associations with neutral or somewhat neutral with molecular markers anyway, um, across the chromosome so that males would have slightly higher diversity than females all over the chromosome. Um, not necessarily representing complete sex linkage, but associations. Now, if I've got time, I don't know if I have, I will just say that the big question mark in that hypothesis and in that interpretation is whether Y chromosome degeneration um, could um, be that old in the related species or whether it could have happened after the divergence between the guppy and those relatives. And this is just showing what I've been able to glean from the literature, including the stickleback literature, about the amount of time, evolutionary time, estimated in terms of synonymous divergence, which I think is the right measure, versus the extent of gene loss or uh, other measures of degeneration. And what you can see is that this micropacilia species here does have very high degeneration, gene loss, compared with the amount of time, compared to what you see in other species that have similar amounts of degeneration. It's the most um, recent. Of course, that doesn't say it's impossible. Perhaps um, this happened after the split from the guppy in this short time, but it does slightly cast doubt on it. I think more work is needed and it's not easy uh, to see a way to test this further. So I will stop at that point and thank again the people um, who did the work, particularly uh, my current postdoc and uh, Lenny Yong, who um, did all this sequencing and the postdoc uh, Suo did all the um, very tough analyses to um, study synonymous variation in, in these data sets. And this is a picture of Lenny collecting the guppies. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. That was, but anyway, I can say, um, Thank you and uh, see if there's any time for questions. Thank you very much. I am very pleased to be here with all of you and thanks to Ben Yuan and Mikhai for organizing this meeting. And I hope we will meet again uh, soon uh, in exactly one year in Prague at ISEP conference. I would like to introduce the issue of philosophical transactions of Royal Society devoted to sex chromosomes evolution in vertebrates. I edited with Matthias Steck. And let's start a little bit with the beginning of the project. So we had several years of friendly discussions that we tried to find a way how to solve social problems. Then we organized two meetings, one in Prague and the second one in Berlin, where we uh, discussed a lot of issues. 
And then it took nearly two years of uh, realization. We are very proud that uh, we had active uh, authors. So we collected uh, 22 papers, which uh, at the end fits to two issues or two, two parts instead of one. So as homework, you can later spot 10 differences uh, in the uh, front cover of the, uh, of the parts. And I hope that we will recover soon from the whole demanding, demanding project. Uh, I would like to start with small recommendation for future authors and editors. First, what appear to be really demanding is to put together a glossary of terms that we are using every day, probably because of divergence and speciation among different research schools. Sometimes uh, a term that you are thinking that everybody understands in the same way make a lot of trouble. So uh, putting a glossary into something is really a nightmare. And also one practical suggestion, ask the production to state that the values of the packages with printed copies are less than 24 euros. Otherwise you can spend a lot of time with uh, uh, custom officers. And that's why I am able to present you in printed copy only the first one and not the second one, which is in uh, Czech custom officers. So, but let's uh, switch to science. So I would like to talk a little bit about concept of the issue. So first we decided to include a best theory of uh, sex determination and related traits in vertebrates. Nevertheless, the core of the issues was to expand and discuss and also celebrate the classical paradigm in sex chromosome evolution. We all know it that sex chromosomes should start their career as autosomes, then one of them uh, receive uh, sex uh, determining gene, then there should be sexually antagonistic uh, uh, alias accommodating around the sex determining locus, which leads to cessation of recombination and degeneration of the W or Y chromosome, potentially also to their disappearance. And we ask our authors to focus on each single progressive step of the paradigm and to discuss it and trying to expand it. So first we discuss what was the situation of the ancestor prior to the origins of sex chromosomes in the canonical model. And we found that in most cases, at least in vertebrates, it was already some species with genotypic sex determination. So it means that mostly evolution of the new sex chromosomes, at least in vertebrates, is uh, a case of uh, sex chromosome turnover. However, we have, as well as there, there are more common in plants, we have also switches from hermaphroditism to genotypic sex determination or from environmental sex determination to genotypic sex determination. We also discuss whether environmental sex determination isn't in fact a squeeze, a press uh, uh, sequential hermaphrodites where the decision about the male or female gonadal development is already shifted by heterochronic shift to early embryonic, uh, embryonic stage. And we also speculated that there could be another heterochronic shift from ESD to genotypic sex determination, this time to very early environmental state, which means to zygote. Uh, in our uh, concluding review of the issues, we also discuss uh, the problems of sex ratio because uh, at least hermaphroditism, hermaphrodites, uh, but also many species with environmental sex determination do not know that they should play the Fisherian, Darwinian uh, negative frequency dependent selection, uh, which should lead to equal uh, investment to, into male and female, uh, female role or uh, in individuals. And we also discuss something which is introduced well by Valentina Peona in Marvel's paper about the possibility that the rotten Y and uh, W can bomb the rest of the genome by transposable elements. And that uh, in the case of the W, it can lead even to female biased uh, mutation, uh, mutations uh, in the rest of the genome. In the next step, we discuss what we know about the 
origin of sex determining loci. And uh, Pan and colleagues uh, made nice table showing that in most of the cases where we know sex determining locus, uh, we can also always see, nearly always see the uh, usual suspects. Nevertheless, in probably likely around 50% of the cases, uh, the emergence of the new sex determining gene was uh, linked to gene duplication, while in the other 50%, roughly 50%, it was allelic diversification. It means uh, that there was already uh, diversification of, uh, uh, of uh, alleles uh, linked to one or the other uh, sex chromosome. And in the review, it's also very, very nicely discussed that sometimes emergence of sex determination can be quite simple and it can require just few or even one point mutation. Nevertheless, in many cases, the emergence of sex determining gene could be very complicated and it could uh, include uh, duplication, translocation, transcription rewiring, and then neofunctionalization connected with many point mutation. And in fact, uh, in at least in some cases, the emergence of the new sex determining gene uh, should be connected with rewiring of the whole uh, sexually uh, sex uh, differentiation uh, genetic genetic network. So uh, we speculated that maybe this complexity could be somehow connected to frequency of turnover of sex chromosome versus stability of sex determination in some uh, lineages. This variability that we uh, that we observe among vertebrate lineages. Uh, we also explore the possibility or variability of potential mechanisms which are responsible for reduction of recombination in sex chromosomes. We uh, all know the classical sexually antagonistic selection where cessation of recombination emerge due to adaptive process after origin of a sex determining gene. Nevertheless, uh, we pointed that uh, more attention should be devoted to neutral models. Under some of them, uh, the cessation of recombination can, can be directly induced by the emergence of sex determining gene because it's connected to heterozygosity and uh, heterozygous loci usually recombine automatically less than uh, homozygous uh, loci. Uh, or there is another intriguing possibility uh, that uh, the low recombination can be present in that region already before the emergence of sex determining gene. Uh, for example, due to heterochiasm, some region can not recombine in one sex if it is the region is not recombining in say male and there is an uh, emergence of male uh, uh, of male determining uh, locus. So this whole genome is not recombining in, uh, in males. Uh, I also would like to point that there is probably important chicken and egg problem, uh, which uh, show us that when we find sexually antagonistic uh, genes on non in non-recombining region of sex chromosomes, we couldn't, couldn't be sure whether really sexually antagonistic uh, was driving cessation of recombination because these genes, uh, these regions, even un under neutral models are linked to uh, sex uh, and say male sex. Uh, so uh, they should be selected for function in one, one sex. So we would need some uh, historical phylogenetic analysis of recombination rate uh, to determine which was, which was first. In the next part, we ask whether there are differences between male and female heterogamity in the rate of differentiation. And Alex Semper and colleagues put together a nice database about differentiation of sex chromosomes in uh, teleost fish. And they found that uh, sex chromosome autosome fusion is more likely under male heterogamity than under female heterogamity. Nevertheless, that uh, sex chromosomes are more likely heteromorphic 
under female heterogamity. So it seems that what we assume that male uh, sex chromosomes, uh, XY sex chromosomes should uh, differentiate uh, faster because there is smaller effective, po effective population size of males in comparison to ma female or uh, male mutation bias uh, or uh, stronger sexual selection in males. All these models probably uh, cannot uh, agree with what we observe at least at the level of heteromorphism uh, in sex chromosome among the lost fish. And we know that, for example, in squamate riptides, the uh, pattern is quite similar. Then we ask whether there are differences between male and female heterogamety in dosage compensation mechanisms. And we found that the traditional uh, postulated dichotomy between female and male heterogamety is not as strong and is not statistically significant. When we uh, listed all the species, but also we counted only lineages with putatively independently evolved sex chromosomes, and whether they have uh, dosage balance or lack of dosage balance, we found that uh, the traditionally assumed parts of the table are overrepresented, but not significantly. And we should also keep in mind that many of the lineages with dosage balance and male heterogamety are insect lineages. And uh, it's quite likely that all insects or most insects have, uh, have um, dosage balance and that uh, these dosage compensation mechanisms can be uh, homologous across uh, many of the insect lineages. So we don't know whether we should really count these uh, female lineages as independent origin of uh, dosage, uh, dosage balance uh, mechanisms. We also ask whether the specific region of sex chromosome have convergent evolution of mechanism of dosage balance. And we found that uh, it's not the case, at least in our comparison of the green anole and soft shell turtle, which evolve sex chromosomes from the same genomic region. And we found that exactly the same genes, which are dosage compensated in the green anole, anole are not at all uh, dosage balance in the, uh, in the soft shell turtle. So it seemed that the same genomic region, once it turned into degenerated differentiated sex chromosomes, may or may not uh, evolve uh, uh, the same uh, dosage compensation, compensation mechanism, that uh, some genes might be uh, dosage compensated only in certain sex chromosomes, but not at all or in the other. And in the last part, we try to ask whether the sex chromosome differentiation pathway is truly unidirectional from poorly to highly differentiated sex chromosome or whether it's more complicated. And you probably uh, expect that it's more complicated. So I will try to exemplify some of the branches off of the classical paradigm. So in some cases, we know that the sex chromosomes can be lost and all of them uh, can be turned to autosome, that there, is, there are some lineages with disappearance of genotypic sex determination. Another case of not so linear, uh, linear process are the cases of uh, species which uh, stayed locked for quite long evolutionary time at certain, quite often early stages of differentiation, or even species which do not have uh, sex chromosomes for a long evolutionary time. But we also know that uh, sometimes there can be a breaking of the Dolos law and the lineage with already differentiated sex chromosomes can turn back to earlier stages of uh, sex chromosome evolution. Uh, in some cases, the Y or W chromosome don't shrink, but it can even expand, especially by accumulation of repetitive elements. And these repetitive elements from uh, Y or W can sometimes even infect Z or X, uh, X chromosome. It happened quite, uh, quite often in the genus uh, Microtus, for example. In some cases, there is addition of a big part of material leading to expansion of uh, pseudo-autosomal region or to emergence of multiple uh, sex chromosomes. And we also discuss possibility that homologous sex chromosome does not mean homologous sex 
a determining system and vice versa. For example, there can be emergence of non-homologous sex determining genes on the same sex chromosomes or the same sex determining gene can jump through the genome, creating the situation of homologous uh, sex determination with non-homologous uh, sex chromosomes. Sometimes uh, B chromosomes can newly become a, uh, become a, 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 a sex chromosome. And sometimes there can be emergence of uh, multiple sex chromosomes like in African pygmy mice or uh, Xenopus tropicalis. And of course, the situation can be, uh, can be complicated by allopolyploidization or by introgression of some sex determining uh, gene uh, by uh, hybridization. So in fact, uh, we think that uh, the uh, sex uh, uh, evolution of sex chromosomes is truly complex process. And here is a, only a small subset of mechanisms, with small subset of examples that shows that uh, the uh, unidirectional pathway can be quite uh, hidden under it. So in conclusion, uh, we think that traditionally assumed differences between differentiation of sex chromosome under male and female heterogamety need a uh, check or re-evaluation. And that the classical model of the evolution of sex chromosome is great. It's ingenious, insightful, very inspiring. Nevertheless, sex chromosome evolution is complex and not linear. And it can be best probably uh, represented by a network of evolutionary trajectories, which branch off to potentially endless outcomes. So thank you very much for your attention. And I will be pleased to uh, reply some question if we still have some time. I'd like to thank the organizers for the uh, interesting symposium, putting it together must have been very challenging. And I'd like to uh, thank also my co-author, Viri Gong, who uh, collected, well, who initiated this project and uh, she, who collected data for it while she was uh, working in my lab for one year and later on uh, when she was back in China and where she is now an assistant pro associate professor at this university. So without her, uh, I wouldn't be uh, doing anything in Ginkgo, but that was, an interesting and challenging experience because that's a big genome, uh, 10 gigs. And uh, it's, uh, I think it's an interesting plan because uh, it's an interesting project because uh, it's the representative of uh, gymnosperms and dice is quite common in gymnosperms and hardly anything is known about sex determination in uh, gymnosperms. And that is, that project was, uh, uh, it was a chance to me to learn something about uh, and uh, not least uh, that's a beautiful plant beautiful tree and uh, many people are interested in it in particular particularly so in in China and uh, uh, two studies recently from Chinese group and semi semi competing Chinese groups published papers about the location of sex determining region in Ginkgo. And uh, this particular paper, which came out in 2019 in BioArchive, it's not published yet uh, in any other form, says that uh, sex determination is quite small. So sex determining region is quite small. It's about 4.6 megs, and it, it is li located here on chromosome two, and then it includes only 16 genes. Uh, while this paper, which came out more recently, uh, last year in Plant Journal, claims that uh, SDR is much larger, 27 megs, and it is located on chromosome 2 uh, with different coordinates compared to uh, what this group is saying. And it contains, it is much larger, it contains uh, more than 200 genes. So the question is who's right? And uh, the first thing I've done when I saw this contradiction was to compare the genes and uh, there is an overlapping set, but not entirely. So the nine out of 16 of these genes overlap with this set, but uh, these genes are not present. And if you look at the distribution of these genes uh, across the genome, uh, 
these guys seem to be consistent uh, with the location of their genes on the chromosome two, but the, the SDR genes identified in the plant journal paper are all over the place. Chromosome two is a hotspot for their genes, uh, but uh, their genes map all over the genome. So it seems um, a bit contradictory. So ho hopefully our results, which are our work, which is still uh, very much in progress, but some results are still already available. Hopefully it will shed some light on uh, where the SDR and sex and um, the Y chromosome is in the donor combining y, y specific region is in Ginkgo. And hopefully it will tell us a little bit about its evolution. So that's our work starting the description of our results starting. The, this is the principle how we did the work. Uh, we uh, used now standard RNA seq uh, in crosses, so we took uh, they, they uh, did crosses back in China, and then uh, she sequenced uh, the progeny and the parents when she was here in Oxford. And uh, the, this allows us to look at uh, not just expression, but uh, the common, the usual way of how people use RNA seq. But uh, you, you can use RNA seq to identify single nucleotide polymorphisms and uh, look at their segregation in the progeny. So in principle, this, uh, this is a quite a powerful method which allows you to identify sex-linked genes uh, due to segregation, very specific segregation. And also it allows us to build genetic maps. And that's the results pretty much. Uh, almost a summary of the study. So we, uh, after doing this, we uh, got a genetic map uh, with 12 chromosomes and over 5,000 genes mapped to those, gene, to those chromosomes and sex maps to chromosome two, uh, which is consistent with previous studies. And the genetic map includes, uh, for this chromosome two includes 442 g genes and uh, 32 genes on that chromosome two were completely linked to sex. The genomic region uh, corresponding where these 32 genes sit is uh, quite large. It's 45 megs, 45 megabases. Uh, and uh, as I will explain later on, we identified four genes out of these 32 uh, with Y specific SNPs, where I'm pretty certain uh, recombination does not happen on the Y chromosome. And that's the first result. Uh, the cutting the first cutting the long story short, uh, this is the integration of the genetic map for chromosome two with the physical position. So these are mega base positions on the chromosomal scaffold for chromosome two and with the male and female maps. They are quite similar to each other. Uh, and uh, sex maps over here. Uh, around 220, 230 megabase. Uh, interestingly, both male and female maps have a region of suppressed or low, at least low recombination. Uh, the region where we don't see recombination in our genetic crosses. Uh, we used four independent crosses and uh, uh, it's not a very large uh, number of F1s, it's uh, only uh, about 100 F1s, uh, but still, so resolution is, uh, is not ideal, but uh, it's sufficient to identify the location of uh, sex determining locus and uh, say that at least in this relatively small uh, genetic family, we don't see any recombination in this region, in neither ma males nor females. Uh, this region, according to the annotation of the genome, contains 143 genes, but uh, because we used RNA-seq, not all of these genes are expressed, so only 32 genes could have been analyzed out of this region, and they're all linked in our crosses, linked entirely, no combination. Look, zooming into that region, uh, so that's again that region uh, where there is no recombination present in our crosses. Uh, we can uh, focus on the 
we can focus further on the region where Y specific SNPs are present. So this is the region where uh, non recombining Y is located. And that's the actual data which allows me to um, claim this is the non recombining Y. So there are, um, we have parents here, mothers and fathers, and F1, subset of F1, subset of F2, just to show you, uh, just to squeeze it on the slide. Uh, and uh, outside this, so outside this uh, small region, outside this small region, we don't see any Y specific SNPs, SNPs which would be go going from father to sons only, and not to females, never and wouldn't ever show in females. And in, in the, within this region, quite small region, over one megabase long, uh, all four genes annotated there are consistently showing Y specific SNPs, uh, which is reassuring. So uh, it looks like this is the uh, Y chromosome, at least uh, well, non-recombining part of the Y chromosome, at least here, the combination shouldn't be happening because males fathers used for this cross are unrelated to each other. Uh, and uh, it is a very low chance that, uh, so uh, this allows us to look at uh, recombination beyond just these crosses. So historically we can look at the um, recombination uh, in the history of coalescent of these males and uh, there is no recombination in this region, but there is outside. So we can claim this is an NRY region in Ginkgo. How wide it is uh, beyond that region, I don't know, because uh, quite a number of genes are missing between this point and this point. Uh, uh, this point, I can see it's already recombining. This is not recombining. Uh, but uh, all the genes in between are not expressed, at least uh, in our sample. And uh, it would need, it would require genomic analysis, quite detailed genomic analysis to figure out how much wider this NRY region is. But it is quite clear it's small anyway. So it's a few megabases long. Using these Y specific SNPs in green, uh, I reconstructed the uh, sequences for the Y chromosome. I have to say that it is quite challenging usually to get the sequences for the Y-linked uh, 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 alleles, uh, the sequences for the Y-linked alleles for plants, because in plants quite often the XY divergence is low, meaning that uh, uh, it's difficult to disentangle, uh, disentangle the X and Y alleles in males from short read data. But uh, it is possible to use to do it using the Y specific SNPs. So if we have uh, females uh, and males, in males we have Y chromosomes and some alleles will be present on the Y. And uh, if we know which alleles are Y specific, we can look for the reads uh, which are corresponding to the X allele and get, get rid of them and uh, fish out the reads with Y specific SNPs and the pairs, this is given if it is the paired mate, mate pair sequence data, uh, you can get this read and the mate pair read and reconstruct the contig. Uh, and that works very well for Ginkgo data. I got pretty much complete sequence for the Y alleles for, for transcripts. And uh, this is the summary of XY divergence for, for the four genes which are located in the non-recombining uh, Y specific region. And the maximal divergence between uh, X and Y is 10% KS. And the other genes show smaller divergence. And uh, we can only guess how old this NRY is because we don't know mutation rate, we don't know the average generation time, but we know that Ginkgo is not starting to reproduce until it is 25, at least 25 years old. So generation time must be 
longer than that. So we can take it as the minimal generation time and we can take the some very high mutation rate, some ad hoc high mutation rate. And this gives us the minimal estimate for the uh, age of Ginkgo non recombining Y from this 10% uh, and which is, which, which is more than 100 million years old. So uh, it looks like Ginkgo NRY is quite old. Looking at the uh, non-silent divergence, uh, it is smaller than silent divergence uh, as one would expect. Uh, and K, KS is uh, below one as one would expect uh, if there is purifying selection present. But these K, KS values are quite high. Usually you see uh, lower values if for other, for other organisms. So it means that if purifying selection is present, it is quite weak. So uh, it may well be that uh, at least the Y allele uh, is accumulating deleterious mutations, but we cannot tell uh, uh, where, so we cannot pol polarize these mutations. We cannot tell from, from this pairwise divergence where mutations happen on the X or on the Y. Uh, so we cannot really say that uh, it is the Y allele which is accumulating these deleterious mutations. Looking at expression, expression for the four genes, so this gene one, two, three, four, five, family one, family two, family three, family four, uh, expression overall is quite high for both the X and the Y and males and females. And that would probably be expected for these genes given we are uh, uh, using RNA-seq and if expression was low, we wouldn't be seeing these genes. Uh, we wouldn't be able to analyze these genes. So maybe there are other genes uh, out there with low expression and we're simply not seeing them. But uh, Looking, focusing at this first column, uh, it is the uh, Y over X expression in males. We see pretty much 50-50 uh, expression. Uh, the ratio is close to one uh, for most genes except one. And for this gene, expression is twofold reduced on the Y chromosome compared to the X chromosome in males. So this suggests some form of degeneration, reduced expression. Uh, at least for one of the genes uh, consistently across multiple families. And uh, looking at expression of, of the X allele specifically in males and females, we can see that uh, X alleles in males, there is only one X copy uh, in male for the non recombining Y region. Um, uh, we can see that uh, it is extremely half uh, as actively expressed as in females. Uh, meaning that there is no upregulation of any kind uh, for these four genes on the X chromosome. And that concludes uh, uh, my rather preliminary results. Uh, I'm saying mine, keep saying mine because uh, my contribution was quite minor and that was exactly the, um, the analysis of the data. So uh, uh, all the errors I made in this analysis are mine and not uh, Ray Gong's. Uh, and uh, surely your data is absolutely perfect. Uh, and that's the conclusions. Uh, uh, we uh, have a relatively small sex determining region, uh, at least four genes and at most 143 genes from based on our segregation analysis. And uh, SDR is on chromosome two. There are two genome assemblies out there published in 2016 and 2021. And uh, that's the location in the old assembly and that's the location in the new assembly. And divergence is modest, but given the uh, uh, generation time is long, uh, it is quite, SDR must be quite old. And hardly any signs of Y degeneration as one would expect actually for very small Y chromosomes uh, because not many genes are linked together. So not much Y degeneration should be happening. Uh, and, uh, Interestingly enough, the combination in this region, sex determining region, is suppressed uh, in both males and females, suggesting that uh, sex determining genes may have evolved in the region which was already uh, having low or reduced recombination uh, before it becomes it, it became the uh, Y chromosome. So pre-existing 
non all recombining region uh, and the SDR region evolves there. Thank you for listening. I try to summarize some uh, of the studies we have been doing on the evolution of uh, recombination suppression on fungal type chromosomes and show how they share patterns with sex chromosome uh, despite fundamental, dif fundamental differences. So yeah, you all know that sex chromosome uh, control uh, the differentiation phenotypes in male versus females. But in fungi, so the, there is no uh, genetically uh, controlled uh, different sex roles such as male or females, but the uh, haploid cells have to be of different mating types to be able to mate. And you can see here, to, here two cells of different mating types, A1 and A2 mating. And you can see that they don't have any uh, size differences and actually they don't have any other uh, phenotypic differences beyond the expression of pheromones and pheromone receptors. And so one of the most puzzling questions in the evolution of sex chromosome, as you know, is to understand uh, why is there an extension of recombination suppression beyond the sex determining genes? And the main heart disease has long been that uh, is due to sexual antagonism. So, and it's, it's uh, obvious that there are many differences between uh, males and females. Uh, and there, there, is, there are some genes with sexual antagonism uh, with uh, alleles that are only beneficial in males, for instance. Uh, this color in the ducks and the crown in the lion or the size of the flower in silene latifolia. And so it makes sense that there could be selection to link these genes to the sex determining genes. Uh, however, there have been no definitive evidence that these sexually antagonistic are really driving uh, the evolution of strata as we have seen today. And alternative hypotheses have been proposed, but uh, still little explored. And one of such hypotheses is that in the sheltering of recessive deleterious alleles, uh, when they are linked to a permanently heterozygous allele, uh, as uh, they would be on the Y chromosome. So we wanted to explore whether other mechanisms than sexual antagonism could drive the step stepwise extension of recombination suppression. And we thought that maybe studying organism without sexual antagonism could be a good way because if we find evolution age strata on this organism uh, without sexual antagonism, it means that other mechanisms can drive the evolution of stepwise recombination suppression. So we study this fungi, the intersmet fungi, uh, so they are pathogenic fungi of plants. Uh, they castrate the plant by producing their um, spores, their violet spores, in, in, the, in the place of pollen in the anthers. So you see here a disease silene latifolia with the mycobotrium smut in the anther. And you can see here a drawing by Charles Darwin in a later, where he showed that the, even the female uh, plant uh, have their ovaries about it and they grow uh, on their full of spores. Um, so you can see here the, the gametes of the fungus, the haploid cell of different mating types, so they don't have uh, much phenotypic differences. And even actually, they don't have any uh, haploid life cycle as different mating types because um, so the teliospore here, uh, uh, diploid spores undergo meiosis and also go for haploid meiotic products. And actually mating occurs really within the tetrad before any haploid stage, but the cell could uh, express different uh, phenotypes uh, when they have different mating types. And another interesting aspect of this fungi is that there are many uh, specialist uh, mycobotrium species on different plant species. So that's a huge diversity um, of different species uh, with uh, mating type chromosomes. And so I'll give you first a, a bit of background on the, the, the mating type plus in basidiomycet fungi. So the basidiomycet fungi are the mushroom, the smuts, and the west. And they have uh, typically uh, two mating type loci, uh, the PR locus uh, controlling uh, the pheromone and the receptor pheromone genes controlling the free mating compatibility and the HD locus with two homeodomain genes and controlling the post-mating compat compatibility. And usually uh, these uh, mating cyclosi are on different chromosomes and so they segregate independently. But in the selfing smut, like the barley smut and the mycobotrium smut uh, that are highly selfing species, 
Uh, actually, the two mating tagloci are on the same chromosome and they are linked by suppressor combination. And we think this is beneficial under the selfing mating system because then they produce only two mating types instead of four. So this increases the odds of compatibility among the gametes of a single diploid individual. So we sequence a high quality uh, genome of uh, several of these microbiomes fungi. You can see here the disease plants. So the, there is one specific microbiome from fungus plant species. And uh, so uh, almost all of these species have uh, their PR and HD uh, loci linked together. But what we found uh, looking at the genome is that actually there were several independent events of uh, HD peer locus linkage across the phylogeny. And uh, so we found at least nine different events uh, of recombination suppression. And we, see, we could see that uh, by looking at the rearrangement. So you can see here the ancestral states uh, with the two mating type chromosome, peer chromosome and HD chromosome. And in one species, for instance, the whole peer chromosome became linked with one arm of the HD chromosome. While in another species, the whole PR and whole HD chromosome became linked together to form the mating type chromosome. And in yet other species, it was yet other rearrangement. So that was strong evidence that there was an independent and convergent event of HD and PR uh, convergent event. And we could date these events uh, between 0.11 and 2.30 million years ago. Um, so that represents striking convergence of Pierre and HD locus linkage by suppressed recombination. And we think this is because of strong selection uh, to increase the odds of gamete compatibility. But what was even more striking was that we found in multiple species also independently, a stepwise extension of recombination suppression beyond this mating type loci. So for instance, in these species parasiting uh, Silene latifolia, we found that uh, there were a uh, very ancient recombination suppression evolutionary strata around each of the Pierre and the HD locus. So extending recombination suppression to genes that have nothing to do with mating type control. And around the Pierre locus, actually there was two independent events and successive events of extension of recombination suppression. And then there, there were uh, chromosome fusion to link the HD and Pierre locus together. And then there were further stepwise extension of uh, recombination suppression away of this huge non recombining region. And what we found is that uh, actually it occurs in many, many species uh, called the microbiome phylogeny, this stepwise extension of recombination suppression to genes not involved in metatide determinism. And actually, it involved different sets of genes in the different species because the, the rearrangement linking HD and PR together were different. So the different set of genes were in the distal region and were concerned by the suppressed recombination. And so we could see this stepwise extension, for instance, looking at the differentiation between the two mating type chromosomes. So you can see here a uh, high allelic divergence between the alleles of the mating type loci themselves. And then a younger suppressed recombination uh, in black that had link linked the HD and Pierre locus together. And then you can see here two recent, much more recent extension of recombination suppression, uh, trapping um, uh, almost here the, the whole uh, uh, mating type chromosome. And so different set of genes uh, were concerned by this uh, stepwise recombination suppression in the different lineages. And uh, we could see uh, that by the, the differentiation between the alleles and also between, uh, because of the transpecific polymorphism until where it extended in the phylogeny. And also looking at the, which species uh, shared the a given evolutionary strata, which also give an indication of about when they appeared. So there have been a repeated uh, linkage of the two mating type loci and a repeated evolution of uh, evolutionary structure beyond the mating type genes. But as I, as I explained, there, there is no male or female function in this fungi, and uh, there is no mating type antagonistic selection uh, because there is almost no haploid phase anywhere where the cells are separated at two different mating types. And we still, uh, we, we looked at the signature of different selection between mating types, but uh, we found none. 
Um, and actually, we found also stepwise recombination suppression around the mating type genes in other fungi, for instance, in this dunk fungus uh, neurospor, uh, the pseudo pseudospora pseudocomata, and also in neurospora tetrasperma, and in the human pathogen cryptococcus neoformans, also in the button mushroom agaricus bisporus, and also in some all my sets like uh, the Doni Mildio Plasma Parabiticola, which is not a fungus but a very divergent uh, lineage. So the, the question is why do uh, this uh, recombination suppression extend with time? So we tried to explore the hypothesis of the uh, um, sheltering of deleterious mutation, uh, building a model. And so the idea is that there are many recessive deleterious mutations in all the genome, we know that from inbreeding depression, for instance. And if there is one inversion that occurs by chance and trap fewer deleterious mutations than average uh, in this genomic region, it will have an advantage, right? Because uh, it, it encompasses fewer deleterious mutations and it cannot recombine uh, to incorporate more uh, deleterious mutations. So it will rise in frequency. But when it rises in frequency, uh, it will become more often homozygous, but then it will suffer from a homozygous disadvantage because then the recessive deleterious mutation will be all homozygous in this interaction. So it cannot increase too much in frequency because this fitness decreases um, when uh, its frequency increases. So it cannot reach fixation, fixation, except if the inversion occur linked to the sex determining locus and to the male determining allele in the XY system. Because then it's always heterozygous, it won't suffer for the homozygous uh, disadvantage. So we simulated uh, some, some genomes with deleterious mutation segregation, segregating and with inversion that could occur. So we simulated a XY chromosome and a, a regular autosome. And we met just inversion occurring regularly and uh, we see uh, whether we assess whether they could reach uh, high frequency. And so in autosome, uh, no inversion could be fixed in the X chromosome either. But in the Y chromosome, there were regularly, so you can see here along the generation, fixation of inversion. And the, the region uh, with inversion increased with time, with generation, and so suppressing directly recombination between the X and the Y chromosome. So really forming, generating the X chromosome with evolutionary strata. So this mechanism seems to be able to generate evolutionary strata. And uh, interestingly, so this uh, mechanism can uh, occur on sex chromosome, but it also can occur on mating type chromosomes that are always heterozygous. It can also occur on uh, supergene that have permanently heterozygous alleles, like uh, the uh, social supergene in ants and the uh, morph, uh, color morph uh, supergene in butterfly uh, that actually show three evolutionary strata. And it also uh, maybe can explain why we found evolutionary strata in fungi, but only in the fungi that are not haploid, that are dicaryotic and in the homomycete that are diploid. And maybe it can also explain why there are not that many heteromorphic cells from the main plants where uh, we have seen today that the haploid selection is uh, more efficient against uh, recessive deleterious alleles. And so I'm also happy to announce uh, um, another uh, meeting uh, next year on sex chromosome and supergene evolution uh, in Paris in the Collège de France, which is a very nice place in Paris, uh, early June. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank, of course, uh, other people involved in all these studies, uh, the students, postdoc, and uh, nice collaborators. And thank you for your attention. Um, I'm going to talk about some work that we've been doing about uh, looking at, at Y haplotypes specifically. So the link between male phenotypic color diversity and Y diversity goes back almost 100 years to Vinga. And he was a Danish geneticist and he kept guppies in his lab in addition to several other um, organisms. And he was interested in the uh, the inheritance of different color patterns. Um, and, and that's what's shown here in one of his hand-drawn plates. And he noticed based on inheritance that, that several of these color patterns appeared to breed true. They were passed perfectly from father to son. 
And that implies Y linkage. And if that's true, it's quite interesting um, because each of those color types, those color patterns represents a unique Y haplotype. And in his relatively small population of, of fish in his lab, he's seen quite a large amount of haplotype diversity. Um, this, these observations went on to inspire our current models of sex chromosome evolution. Um, and also a lot of phenotypic work that has, uh, in, in many labs, that has identified uh, an association over and over again between color, particularly Y color, or particularly orange color and the Y chromosome. And we wanted to sort of dissect this a little bit more fine scale. So we asked the question several years ago, what's the link between color and guppy Y diversity? And this really got going about five years ago when we went to Trinidad to collect um, across three rivers, the Yara, the Aripo, and the Quarry. Uh, this is one of the field sites. And we went back to collect because we wanted to do 10x genomic link read sequencing. And, and this is a, a single molecule approach. Um, and if you have sufficiently high molecular weight samples, um, you can actually phase the X from the Y, which is very, very helpful. Um, so we collected 10 males and 10 females from each of two populations, one upstream low predation, one downstream high predation in each of these three rivers. And for all of the individuals that we sequenced with 10X, we built full individual genome assemblies that were of, of actually quite good quality. And for everything I'm gonna show you next, we mapped back our reads to the highest quality female genome assembly from each river. So these are river specific analyses and that turns out to be quite important um, because there are a lot of inversions on the X in uh, the species and there are um, some, some duplications that can complicate mapping if you're working across uh, even relatively small phylogenetic distances. So this is some work that Pedro Almira led. Uh, it built off work that Allison Wright did. And I'm just gonna talk about stratum one. And I, I don't think stratum one is controversial anymore. It, it was initially, but uh, Bonnie Fraser has found the, the exact same pattern as we did. She orders and orients her scaffolds a little bit differently because of that, that inversion issue I mentioned, but it's, it's the same pattern. Uh, so we found a, a reasonably small region uh, with reduced coverage in males. And it's really due to drops in two specific regions on either end. Um, and I'm showing you here male and female coverage across the chromosome, chromosome 12. In that region, uh, we also saw an accumulation of male specific SNPs. So these are SNPs present in some proportion of males, but absent from all females. The haplotypes cluster um, by Y chromosome in this region. So, and that indicates uh, complete lineage sorting and recombination suppression well before the colonization of that river. Uh, there's an accumulation of male specific sequence. I'm happy to talk about that. I'm not going to show it. And this is some work by Dave Metzger showing that in that region, uh, there's a pattern of male hypomethylation suggesting a sexualization of gene regulation, which is consistent with our understanding of sex chromosomes. Yulia also worked on this and, and she worked on several different species, but what's relevant here is that she worked, uh, she compared reticulata, the Trinidad guppy, with uh, Enler's guppy, Basilia wingii, and, and it, depending on your phylogenetic preferences, this is either a subspecies or a separate species. Uh, regardless, it's an outgroup to uh, the, the Trinidad guppy. And we see the same conservation of, of uh, stratum one in Endler's guppy. It's, it's more exaggerated, suggesting that there's more degeneration in that region compared to the Trinidad guppy reticulata. Uh, she's also got phylogenetic evidence um, of this, uh, that the, the stratum predates the split of these two species. And she also noted, uh, found evidence of a second part at the far end of the chromosome right next to that stratum. And, and that turns out to be where the vast majority of recombination occurs in males. So to get back to the question, are we seeing haplotype diversity in these rivers that's consistent with what Vinga was observing in terms of phenotype diversity? And, and the answer is yes. So these are different haplotype maps for Y haplotypes. So these are phased Y haplotypes. Uh, if you're not used to looking at haplotype maps, each circle represents a different haplotype. Uh, the line connecting circles uh, represents the number of mutational steps between them, and the size of the circle represents the number of individuals with that haplotype. Um, and what we were seeing is, is quite a lot of haplotype diversity in stratum one, much more than we might expect. And we next wanted to ask the question, how does this haplotype diversity relate to color diversity? 
And this is some work by Jake Morris. So Jake took out all the fish uh, from our lab population. Our lab population originates from the quarry. Um, and he, he took a high-res photo and, and he was concerned about, you know, how we identify specific ornaments by eye. And so he built a bioinformatic approach where the computer actually sort of auto automatically extracts the pixels from these pictures and clusters them to identify ornaments. And using this approach, he identified four ornaments um, that were orange, that were present in at least 10% of the males in our population, shown here as 01 through 04, and five black or melanic ornaments um, that were again present in at least 10% of our population, B1 through B5. And he asked the question, are these Y-linked? And that's actually quite straightforward. So if something is Y-linked, um, if a male has it, he will pass it on to all his sons. If he doesn't have it, none of his sons will. Um, and so to ask this question, he set out four pedigrees representing four different Y haplotypes. And um, for each generation, he photographed and took this approach with all the sons um, and went through several generations and looked at each of the ornaments. And so this is the, the percent of males who, the, the presence of that ornament in the population and the bottom row is the proportion of males in the pedigrees that were the same in either orange or black or different in gray to their fathers. And the pattern is not consistent for any ornament um, of white linkage. And this was initially quite perplexing and until he noticed really strong correlations for size and saturation among ornaments of the same color. Um, and this suggests a modifier locus, which is affecting all the ornaments in the same biochemical pathway. And when he looked at that, he was he actually picked up a very clear Y effect for total orange area, orange saturation, and black area. And you can detect the Y effect by comparing a male to his paternal grandfather, looking at the correlation with his paternal grandfather with whom he shares a Y, and comparing that to the correlation between that male and his maternal grandfather with whom he does not share a Y. And you can see the correlation is much stronger uh, with the paternal compared to the maternal grandfather. Walter has also been working on this. Uh, he's got a, a slightly different approach. He's also taking high-risk photos of all the fish in our population. And he's built a deep learning approach to both identify the outline of the fish and identify the outline of the ornaments. Um, and, and both of those are, are quite labor intensive uh, without computational um, assistance. And he's using this as in an evolve and reseq approach. So he's selecting three replicate lines for increased orange area and three for decreased orange area. And he's finished the first generation. And we see very clear um, evidence in the up selected lines in red, uh, more orange, um, and compared to the down selected lines in, in blue. But what's really interesting is, is after this first generation, we're seeing very little um, contribution of the Y chromosome to this effect. So he's looking at autosomal inheritance or uh, genetic variation contributing to the phenotypes and, and Y-linked variation. And that's really consistent with Jake's uh, results. So how does haplotype relate to color diversity? And at least in our lab population, it doesn't. Um, so these are quite labor intensive approaches, but I think it would be super helpful if we could apply them to additional populations to understand more um, about the diversity across different watersheds. I wanted to finish up on a different haplotype story. So this is some work by Ben Sankam, and, and he's been working um, on Pacilia pere. So when we went out to Trinidad, we also went to Guyana to collect this species. And it's, it's really interesting because it has five different types of males, um, which I've shown here. Uh, so the bottom fish is a female. Each of the, the males above her is a, a different morph. Um, the morphs differ in terms of behavior, physiology, sperm production, uh, their mating tactics, and um, obviously their color. And they are all white linked. So whatever morph a male is, all his sons will be the same morph. Ben also took a, a 10x based approach so he could pick types. Um, and he um, initially compared it, so it's, it's relatively closely related to a species called Pacilia picta, which Yulia had worked on and shown had um, a high degree of degeneration um, of the Y chromosome. It's the same chromosome as in Trinidad guppy and Endler's guppy. Um, ben used the Cyphophorus genome um, to, to name his chromosomes, um, but Cyphophorus chromosome 8, which is not a sex chromosome in Cyphophorus, is the same as guppy chromosome 12, which is the chromosome in both guppies and uh, Pacilia peri, um, and the orientation is flipped. So this, this little bit at the, the beginning of the chromosome is actually that, that far par 
um, at the, the other end. So it's just flipped compared to what Yulia was showing you before. Um, and what he saw is the same pattern of generation. Um, and that's in the bottom panel. So Pasilia picta is in green and Pasilia pere average is in black. And you can see that aside from that par, male coverage is much less across the entire length of the chromosome consistent with widespread degeneration of the Y. Um, it also has complete dosage compensation like Pasilia picta. Um, and so it, this is really suggesting an ancestral origin of um, Y degeneration and dosage compensation in the ancestor of these two species. And that leads to the interesting question, did Y degeneration occur before the origin of the five morphs or after? Um, because if the morphs post-date Y degeneration, that implies a degree of um, adaptive potential on Y chromosomes that we don't usually assume. Ben took a Weimer approach. So you can break genomes of individuals into very small words, 31 base pairs in our case, and essentially bioinformatically subtract female genomes from male genomes. Um, and if you do that, you'll be left with things that are only present in male genomes in theory because they're on the Y chromosome. So Andy Clark did this years ago when he was working on the Drosophila Y and he called these Weimers. You can do lots of things with Weimers. Uh, you can map them back to your Illumina reads, your scaffolds, or your haplotypes as we have to um, assemble Y sequence. We also treated them like a phylogenetic character. So we looked at the presence or absence of the Weimers that, that were identified across all the males that we had sequenced. And you can see that we sequenced lots of males from each of the morphs. Um, and what was really interesting is that phylogenetically, each of these morphs um, cluster together. Um, they're monophyletic, essentially, for the Y chromosome, implying um, that, it, and that's capitulating what we already know, uh, that these represent different Y haplotypes, each of these morphs. And what's great to see um, is that PICTA is the very clear outgroup based on the Weimer analysis, suggesting that um, the five perimale morphs emerged after the divergence with peri, uh, or with PICTA and therefore um, diversified after recombination suppression and Y chromosome degeneration. And with that, I'm, I know I'm out of time. I need to thank the lab um, and, and in particular here, everyone uh, whose work I presented, uh, the people who pay us are our collaborators with whom we could not do this work. And I need to call out uh, Jocelyn Shu and Clara Lacey who did the illustrations uh, for much of, of this presentation. And thanks again to the organizers for putting all this together. Right. Thank you for thank you for the introduction. If you don't hear me, just uh, show your hand. Um, we have uh, almost the last presentation today, and I'm really happy that you here beforehand already presented a lot about sex chromosome evolution or sex chromosomes in, in spiders. And I want to talk about how conserved uh, these sex chromosomes seem to be in spiders. Um, and before I start, I want to uh, tell you that most of what I've been presenting today are actually a master thesis from Malte Krepold. And I'm really happy that he did his work with us because that's a great result. Um, so if you look at spiders and you've already heard that today, uh, the X1, X2, zero system is the most predominant in spiders. And I show you a graph that's not from us. That's another uh, working group from Arroyo. Um, that uh, tells you quite uh, significantly that we have these red bars are for the X1, X2, zero system, and there are a couple of other systems that are also widely found, but less than X1, X2. The studies of these sex chromosomes in spiders so far has been done with uh, karyotyping and sometimes a fish uh, uh, fluorescence uh, in situ hybridization. And um, you've seen there are a couple of hypotheses about how these X chromosomes emerge in the spiders and how they evolve. Uh, but so far, there has been really, really not much uh, done about the gene content of these X chromosomes. So we know what they look like, but we don't know what's on them. Um, and there has been one study I'm aware of uh, that was uh, conducted on Stegodiphus. More about that later. So what we wanted to know right at the beginning is that uh, actually we wanted to have uh, sex specific molecular markers to be able to uh, sex spiders uh, when they were really little, which is not possible so far. But um, while I began working on that, I discovered so many 
um, spots where we could learn something new that we developed these projects. And before I show you the results, I wanted to say a few words about spiders that have been quite underrepresented so far. And uh, there is a simple reason, reason for that is that the genomes are really big. So until a couple of years ago, it was really complicated to sequence them. Uh, now it's better. Um, but there are really interesting studies, uh, species for studying sexual selection, sexual dimorphism. On the right, you have an example of youth sexual dimorphism. You have the big one is a female and the small one, and they're both adults, is a male. Um, and uh, these spiders, uh, many of them produce silks and, and venoms that are interesting in biomolecules. And they have, uh, they are an ancient group that is, uh, has very different ways of living with the web, without, and so on. But they seem to have a quite consistent sex chromosome system, even though there are a few exceptions. Um, and the methods we use to go about that and find uh, what would be, what kind of loci we would have that are on the sex chromosome is we use the method that was developed by Aline Müll. Um, originally actually for plants, but it did work on animals already. And uh, it was the first time I think we tested that on a, on a system that has X0. So X1, X2, X0 is almost the same. And we looked at the segregation of alleles uh, that should be different, whether you're looking at a locus that is on a set chromosome or a locus that is on an autosome. So we have a, a expectations and what it does is that we uh, do a cross in a control cross for a family and then look at how alleles segregate and depending on the patterns we see we can say okay this locus is on a set chromosome this locus isn't. Um, to do that we had a family um, and we uh, conducted RNA-seq which is a plus when you have huge genomes it's sufficient to do RNA-seq to get to the SNPs. Um, it's enough uh, so that can be interesting for people that have uh, not so much money and big genomes. Uh, QC and trimming, so you know the, the gist of it. Um, and at the end, we could uh, conduct the analysis with a sex detector, which is the tool that Aline uh, developed a few years ago. Um, the start was a male-female and offsprings. Um, and uh, at the end of this pipeline, if you want to look it up, there is a paper about it, is that we could assign um, about half of the transcripts we had in the assembly to either an autosome or a sex chromosome, not really X1 or X2, but just sex chromosome. And um, uh, among these assigned loci, we had then uh, autosomal, um, uh, most of them, and a few were sex linked. So we would expect they would be on an X chromosome in the spiders, 600 of them. Um, and we did then afterwards a lot of comparative genomics actually, because even though spiders have been neglected in genomics, there is some data we can compare to. And here you see uh, a presentation of uh, ontology of these uh, transcripts we have. So we were working with Trachonifila senegalensis, which is found in South Africa uh, and on the African continent. Um, then the next kit of um, related is Trachonifila clavipes and a few others species of spiders, other chelicerates, and then insects. And you can see that Trachonifila share quite a lot of, um, of genes and uh, chelicerates among them, not so much. Here, that's the dark blue one. Uh, but how much they share is actually not relevant to our uh, study. We want them to share something to be able to do comparative genomics, but uh, a better picture could be obtained with real genomes um, and uh, comprehensive analysis. Um, we used Tigridaifus mimosarum because that was the only study so far. So that's a, a, a spider that is uh, um, showing social behavior, which is quite rare in, in spiders. And it was the only species so far or only group so far where some kind of sex chromosome or uh, sex linked uh, uh, loci were found. And we wanted to know whether the loci we found were actually also sex linked in Stichodiphus. So there was a genome assembly, and through gamete sorting and RedSec, Bestgard et al. Uh, found out what was sex linked in 2019. And here we are, a quite good match. If our loci are sex linked, then to 84%, they are also sex linked in Stichodiphus. 
and vice versa. If our loci are autosomal linked, uh, then to 96%, they are also on an autosome in stegodiapus. So it looks good already. And what is surprising about it, uh, if you keep that in mind, is that stegodiapus and trichonephila are really, really far apart uh, in evolutionary time. They, they are um, antelogine against um, the other group. They are really different groups, millions of years, and yet we have a lot of conservation. It looks like it. The next comparison we made was with Agaiope brunicki uh, for a couple of months now. There, there was the first chromosome level assembly. And our expectation in that case is that our sex-linked um, loci, if there were conservation of chromosomes or gene content on, on sex chromosomes, would all land on two different linkage groups that were um, uh, found with high C sequencing in Agaiope brunicki um, and um, that's what happened. So it looks great. We have these all these chromosomes or pseudo super scaffold that are generated through high C analysis. They are numbered uh, according to their size. One is the is the biggest, and thirteen is the smallest of these these linkage groups. Let's say it that way. And here you have the sex linked um, are really falling onto two of these pseudo scaffolds, pseudo chromosomes, and that's great because it fits our expectation of conservation between Trichonephila and Agaiope brunicki. Um, we did the same with another, sorry, animation problems. Um, and we did the same with another species that was sequenced uh, a few months ago uh, also. And here again, the same happened. We have two big groups, two big, uh, uh, pseudo scaffold that were actually all of our loci that are sex linked in trichonephila have a match. Um, and they have much less matches here and on the autosomal side. Um, so this looks great. And it tells us that across spiders, there seem to be quite high conservation of gene content on the sex chromosome. And also, we had another story coming up, and why it's interesting is coming in the next slide. Um, it seems like the Ox, Ox cluster, developmental cluster, that is really important in all animals, um, seems to be on the X chromosome, which is a bit surprising. Um, and if we look at uh, these two spiders with the chromosome level assembly, then we have an intact Ox cluster on the chromosome um, 9, which is one of the sex chromosomes, and on chromosome 12 in the other species, which is also the sex chromosomes, according to our comparative analysis. And both of them have an Hox cluster that seem to be a bit broken. There are some stuff missing, or um, the annotation is not great. And both of these are, in both species, not on the sex chromosomes. Uh, why is that important? Because, as you know, um, if you have multiple copies of an X chromosome, you have a lot of the genes, or you potentially have a lot of transcripts for the genes that are on the X chromosome, more than you would have if they were on the autosomes. Um, so we looked also at the uh, dosage compensation in our species, um, because having that might mean that you have a way much more transcripts for the host cluster in females than you have in males. They have a double uh, amount of X chromosomes. Um, we looked at it and we're not yet decided what it means. Um, as you can see, the significance patterns are a bit uh, all over the place. We have a comparison between autosomal and uh, sex linked loci, and uh, female is orange, male is blue. Um, you can see that there is a difference between female. It all in 2017 gave for different kinds of dosage compensation, type 1 to 4. Ours fit a little bit with type 3. I hope you can still hear me. Um, and there is um, incomplete compensation without balance. That's what it looks like, albeit not the whole way through. So a reason for that would be that we didn't do organ-specific uh, sequencing, or perhaps uh, there was not enough control. There is plenty of hypothesis why the pattern is not that clear. 
Uh, and to circle back to what, why we started at the beginning to look at that, we wanted to develop sex uh, specific markers to be able to say an egg or a little spiderling is a, a female or a male, which usually you can only tell after the eighth mold, so when they are almost adults. Um, we verified, we validated our findings of X-linked or uh, autosomal linked uh, through a qPCR approach on genomic DNA. And the expectation is that you would have a male-female ratio that is one if you have an autosomal loci and a male-female ratio that is 0.5 if you have a sex-linked loci. And here you have the results for the autosomal. So we are around one with all the technical uh, issues that you might have with qPCR. And if we look at um, the uh, sex-linked uh, that we had on these three, uh, four different loci, the ratio is uh, significantly different. It's around 0.5 and needs uh, optimization to have a really good picture. These methods can be, can be really important for other fields that have nothing to do with sex chromosome evolution, but nevertheless quite interesting to spider researchers. Um, most of them are behavioral ecologists and uh, that could be interesting for them. And last but not least, uh, we also had the opportunity with this approach to test for um, the evolutionary rate of different groups of loci. On the one hand, the sex linked, on the other hand, the autosomal. Uh, we represented here the lack information, so all the ones where we don't know, they are either on the one or the other. And we used the information we had on our transcripts, uh, did a comparative analysis with transcripts from Clavipus. It was a protein based alignment and then calculated the KAKS ratio. And it appears that the KAKS ratio is slightly higher in the sex-linked um, um, loci than it is in the autosomal loci. From that, I would say we have some evidence for faster evolution, which actually needs way more um, um, uh, investigation. This uh, finding is congruent with what was, uh, was um, found in Stegodiphus, what I uh, told you about uh, before. Um, and that's uh, an approach that needs to be extended to new analysis, new um, sequences, new genomes that are coming up in spiders. With that, I would like to conclude with what's coming next. So perhaps uh, it appears through the talk in spiders, we are much less advanced than we have uh, uh, when then you are on the uh, sicklebacks or many other systems. Um, I hope I make clear why, and it's actually a really interesting field because uh, I think uh, it's um, um, surprising that despite the big evolutionary distance between the different spider species, there seem to be quite a high con uh, conservation of gene content and gene sequence. Um, we will publish that hopefully in the special issue that is coming up. And if you know about a spider assembly where we could look at that up and, and uh, see whether the patterns uh, repeat itself, then I would be really happy to hear about it. And the next step would be to look at the sequence homology between um, whole X chromosomes, perhaps whole bits of X, X chromosomes. And uh, we are also looking at um, Agarifei Bruniki now and uh, see what happens. And that's coming up as well. I would like to thank you for your attention. These are the people that helped and that did the project. And uh, if you have questions that you don't have time to ask now, uh, please feel free to write me an email. Good introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so my talk is titled Hunting for the W Chromosome um, Optimizing Sex Determination Research Pipelines for Archenia Seneca. Um, and as a background, Archenia Seneca is a species of brine shrimp that's endemic to hypersaline lakes. Um, they can bear both live and dormant offspring. And it's been known since the 1960s that a Seneca possesses a CW6 chromosome system and that it's a female heterogametic species. Um, so even though there has previously been research about the C chromosome, a lot less is known about the W chromosome. And the the goal of uh, the Because group at IST Austria is to use bioinformatics to find promising candidates for genes on the W chromosome and that play a role in sex determination in the species. So the methodology that I used during my internship at uh, IST Austria this summer was um, to first distinguish female versus male transcripts and then recovering the female RNA reads, uh, assembling and 
moving transcripts under 200 pp uh, using Trinity and that moving on to primary filtering stage of those transcripts. Um, via BLET, they then mapped the genomic reads to uh, the outputs of the KMA pipeline uh, using Bowtie 2, and there was a secondary filtering stage of the results using BLAD. And the idea it was to change the experimental parameters for several different um, parts of the pipeline that was used. And those were the DNA camer size, the RNA camer size, the minimum count, the minimum camer fraction, and the minimum colored fraction. Um, and what you see here in yellow are the variations, basically. And while there were some technical issues and time constraints due to this just being a short summer internship. Um, I don't have any statistically significant results to report, but um, it has been interesting to see how the, the changes of experimental parameters really impact the output that we get from these pipelines. And that's certainly something that future research will be able to use in order to generate uh, more general principles um, to evaluate other pipelines and optimize them, which is uh, really useful in just making the research process in this field both more smooth, um, but also more efficient. And that also allows us to adapt then pipelines to other non-model organisms, um, which is going to further our understanding of sex determination as a whole. So um, finally, I would like to thank Professor Vicoso and her group at IC Austria for the opportunity to work on this project um, and the Austrian Agency for International Cooperation and Education Research for funding um, and my co-author Marvin Elkrady, who's a PhD student.